guys, this is Lala Legacy, and welcome back to another episode of Seabed. So, let's jump right back in. <clears throat> you had another fit. Mayuko's voice rolled out like thunder. As I opened my eyes, I saw her rising from her futon and coming over to me. I closed my eyes again and responded by furrowing my eyebrows. I heard the rustling of clothes. Mayuko probably crouched down in front of me. Something touched my ears. I felt as though there was an intense, raging gust of wind trying to escape my ear canals now that this warm sensation had blocked it. I could hear the sound of pulsing blood, but it wasn't mine. As I began to focus on that sound alone, the others gradually faded out. Mayuko was covering my ears with both of her hands. The somewhat nostalgic sound of pulsing blood drowned it out all other noises. I didn't mean to wake you, I'm sorry. I tried saying that, but with my senses of hearing going completely haywire, I wasn't sure whether my voice actually came out or not. Mayuko remained silent, keeping her warm hands on my ears. That warmth slowly traveled to my frozen cheeks. I felt the storm drawing further away. The noise at my eardrums were or was gradually subsiding with every passing second. As my heart rate uh, as my heart rate began to drop, I finally began calming down. Seriously, are they together? <laughs> the violent sounds drilling through my brain had finally died down. I touched my Yuko's hand, signaling that she could let go. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay now. Mayuko tilted her head to look at my face. Oops. Uh-oh. <laughs> I... did not click that. <laughs> Let's check message history. Okay. I tried saying that. Nope. Here it is. Mayuko tilted her head to look at my face in the moonlight. The area around your eyes seemed reddish. Did you have a scary dream? I closed my eyes, trying to recall what had happened right before that bit. I think I did have a dream, but it wasn't scary. If anything, it made me feel nice, or it made me feel warm and nice. I couldn't recall exactly what the dream was about, though. And I didn't feel like trying too hard, either. Especially after that nightmarish ear-ringing fit I just had. Will you be able to go back to sleep now? I took a few moments to make sure everything all right, or around me sounded okay, then slowly nodded. On the other hand, with my mind finally clear, I couldn't help but wince at what all, or what all this implied. Well, let's make sure to check your diary tomorrow, and see if you haven't forgotten something again, okay? Okay, so she's writing in her diary to make sure that she doesn't forget stuff. Oh yay, another tip has been unlocked. Narasaki Clinic. Consultation room has been unlocked. Bedroom has also been unlocked. We will check those out the next time that I record Z-Bed. Chapter 2. The Hilltop Mansion. And we got the forest achievement! The smell of a winter forest assailed my nostrils as the train car's doors slid open. The platform I stepped on seemed to be made of stone. A gust of cold, humid wind blew a bunch of dried leaves up the mountain. The Russell train left the station, its sluggish movements rema er, reminding me of an old man with a cane. The station was silent enough for me to make out even the rustling of grass. Stepping inside the station, I spotted a sign with the station name spelled out on it. There was also a bluish plastic bench, its faded, or its faded color, the result of constant exposure to rainfall. Likely no one had sat on that thing in, a, or in months. I took a few steps forward on the uneven, stone-paved road with patches of grass sprouting from its cracks. 
My suitcase's wheel got stuck in one of the said cracks. Realizing I wouldn't get far like this, I picked it up and continued. Oh my god. My stupid fucking mouse. I picked it up and continued carrying it in my arms. I could see a large oak tree in the front of the station. The station itself was a wooden building sporting wooden uh, wooden window frames with a bored yawning a uh, yawning station warden loitered uh, can't even read right now cuz I'm so mad at my mouse. <laughs> Uh, with a bored, yawning station warden loitering around its vicinity. I began rummaging through the bag in my hands, looking for my magnetic ticket card. As I walked closer to the ticket machine, the warden finally noticed me. He was wearing a blue uniform, but his tie was crooked and he had no cap on. I soon spotted the cap hanging on the wall next to the desk he was sitting at. I finally found my wallet. Exiting the station, my gaze once again fell on that same oak tree from before. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that it was somewhat slanted, hanging above the narrow road that only had space for a single car. Speaking of which, there was an old-looking car parked at the side of it. Oh, it's her! Okay. <laughs> and next to said car stood a long-haired woman in a kimono. She was fixing her hair, looking at her vague reflection in the car window. As I approached her, she spotted me and turned around. <laughs> Miss Mizuno! That's right, long time no see! It really has been a long time. You came to pick me up. Of course I did! Oh hey, just put your bag here. She opened the rear door of the car, her graceful movements in odd contrast with her somewhat crass manner of speech. With my bag on the back seat and me sitting in the front, our car began climbing the mountain path. N uh, Nanai was at the wheel. Seeing someone driving in a kimono was an odd sight to say the least. Still, she had to stuff her long sleeves into her sash and take off her clogs. We slowly but surely ascended the mountain, following the twisting, chaotic road. Near the curve to our left, we saw a rusted guardrail and a round mirror on an orange pole. To our right stretched the vast mountain slope, illuminated by sunlight filtering through the multitude of naked branches, their leaves long since shed. Nanai sounded a brief uh chuckle, I think it said. <laughs> Your fancy ma or magnetic train card won't work here. Seems that way, yeah. I never even considered it. So that's why it took a while for you to get out of the station. You totally caught me off guard since I figured you'd be coming with the next train. I watched the patchy shadows of the foliage dance above, or above dance upon the surface of the road. Apparently, it had rained here recently. The few remaining drops of water sparkled on the leaves in the late afternoon sun. The car tilted a bit as its tires drove into one of the deeper puddles in the road with an audible splash. I held onto my seat, doing my best to maintain my balance. Uh, better watch out, the roads around these parts can get tricky. Noted. The car seemed to have lost its seatbelt over the years. So I had no choice but to rely on the door handle to keep myself in place, and that's a scary thought. The leather seat would change its shape with every jerk of the car. Through rough, <laughs> or though rough to the touch, the seat wasn't uncomfortable to sit on. It accepted my weight with just the right amount of resistance. The interior wasn't made of cheap resin sheet, but quality wood. Most likely the only reason it hadn't completely fallen apart by now. I spotted an animal toy that looked like a cat with long ears, and a small bottle of aromatic dried flowers hanging from the front mirror. The car's interior had that certain vintage smell to it, with a hint of an orange-like fragrance lingering about as well. The sea will come into view in just a sec on our left. Her words made me shift my gaze to the window. Through the leaves of... 
uh, chinquapin trees and wild camellia bushes, I could make out a small port town, as well as the sea further beyond it. As I admired the deep blue hue of the waves visible through the moving foliage, a high-pitched... Mm. Okay, you can stop now, fucking mouse. A high-pitched sound, almost like a flute, filled my ears out of nowhere. Was that a green pigeon? I fought with the handle for a while to roll down the stubborn window. The wind, carrying the salty scent of the sea, blew into my face. I brushed the hair off my face and listened in to the cries of winter birds as the cold wind caressed my skin. We managed to continue on a proper road for a while, but soon enough we were back to driving through a rough mountainous path. If we had continued down that road, we would have ended up at the port! Nanai began telling me how she participated in some hotel owner meeting in the town earlier today, and how she spent the rest of her time in the market district shopping for supplies. Apparently, she managed to find some unusually choice ingredients at the bargain or at a bargain price. In other words, I had dinner to look forward to. The trees became more scarce as we climbed higher up the mountain. There was almost nothing blocking my view of the port town anymore. From this angle, it looked like a split or a split bowl opening to the sea. There were no tall structures in sight. The lack of obvious office buildings gave the land a sense of serenity and calmness. It really made me feel like I'd entered the countryside. I spotted an arch that indicated the entrance to a shopping district. Beyond that, small buildings with red and blue roofs lined the road like a mosaic. As the road edged closer to the sea, even those buildings became scarcer. There were ships and boats of various sizes anchored on the other end of the big levee or, or surrounding the town. Some were even sailing into the sea as I watched. I noticed a lot of poles embedded in the bay area a little further away from the city. Are you building something there? I think those are seaweed farms. Oh. I love seaweed. How about you, Sachiko? I don't mind it. In that case, you should take some home with you. We've got plenty. We're almost there. As we cleared another curve with lush and blooming red camellia, tree, or camellia bushes, I suddenly felt as though I saw a thin line connecting the mountain and the port town. Can you see the gondola cable? I had to bring lots of stuff with me today, so I used the car. Er, gondola, sorry, gondola cable. Blah. <laughs> I had to use the car, but it's usually a lot faster to just use that to get to the town. Hmm. My place is just a little further away from the station. I spotted a brown roof between the slanted white trunks of the trees and the reddening even evening sky. The car took another turn at a three-way junction. Upon asking what, or what was there on the opposite side, I learned that there was a small mountain village nearby. I heard the cry of a green pigeon again. We passed by a hedge fence with several yellow flowers growing on it before finally reaching the actual inn. The actual building was colored in dull brown and looked like it could melt into the snow-laden uh, winter forest behind it at any moment. Windows with wooden frames lined the flat brick wall. Most of them were covered in ivory curtains from the other side. The tires made low crackling sounds as they drove over the gravel driveway. The car jerked a few times as Nanai slowed down to align the vehicle to the parking spot. After a few more adjustments, we finally came to a complete halt. We're here! I stepped out of the car, feeling slightly wobbly after all that shaking but the invigorating scent of flowers pulled me back to reality. I followed Nanai along the gravel road, which was covered almost completely in golden flower petals. Impressed by how her sash didn't seem to come undone after all that shaking, 
I glanced over her shoulder to inspect the inn. One side of the building was rounded, uh, was ro- er, yeah, was rounded and rose towards the sky like a tower. Its lattice windows only adding to the or to that image. It also had a pointy roof that reminded me of a witch's hat. From it extended a triangular roof with a few windows that covered the middle of the building. The rest of the roof was flat with a white fence for its par or parapet. Tall trees behind the building extended above its roof, their colored leaves rustling the, or in the wind. The semicircular side of the building went out of view as I ascended the fan-shaped stone stairs at the entrance. The double doors had three rectangles carved at their bottom and a window at the top. Above the windows, there was a rectangular patch of stained glass. <sighs> Nanai picked up my bag with one hand while, uh, while turning the metal handle with the other. She pushed the door half open with her shoulder, and then turned back toward me. Welcome, dear guest! Wait here for a bit. Nanai swiftly disappeared into the room beyond the lobby desk. The room fell into complete silence with her gone. The sun had almost completely set, yet the lights in the lobby were still off. The only thing to illuminate the floor was a rectangular patch of colorful light that filtered in through the stained glass. For a while, I kept staring absent-mindedly at the lobby desk. Its black wood surface was surprisingly cold to the touch. Behind the desk, I could see a fancy-looking cabinet with arched cat-like legs. Upon the shelves, I also spotted some old foreign-looking postcards, an artificial flower, and some early Christmas decorations, among other things. A transparent vase rested on the lobby desk with a camellia branch placed in it. Next to it was a silver mechanical register decorated with vines. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Nanai appeared in the doorway holding a green journal. Hmm? Oh, it's working just fine, don't worry! Realizing I was looking at the register, she pushed one of its buttons, causing the lower half to open up with a lively ka-ching! There were a few bills and some coins inside. Oh, we don't really use it much, though. And then I closed it with another ka-ching. Then, er, she then placed the journal on the lobby desk. I want you to sign your name here. Yes, here. Then here. And here! After pointing out three places on the paper with her fountain pen, Nanai popped its cap off and handed it to me. I signed my name three times. The grandfather clock that towered near the uh, far wall of the lobby had just struck the hour. The clock's hands signaled that it was five o'clock. I'll show you to your room! Nanai stashed the journal under the desk, then circled around it. I was about to nod when the camellia branch trembled in the vase, almost as if to answer in my stead. Well, if this doesn't look familiar... <laughs> we ascended the semicircular stairs and took a right turn on the second floor corridor. The floors creaked under my steps. Windows lined the wall on my right. Looking out one of them, I could see the inner yard and its stone-paved path through the crown of leaves. To my left, I noticed several doors, all of which bore the same designs as the ones at the entrance. Oh, that's pretty. We turned the corridor at the L-shaped... Or, sorry, we turned the corner at the L-shaped corridor when the knife finally stopped. <laughs> this is your room! It's pretty! She turned the key in the lock, opening the door. After entering the room, she left my bag at the side of the bed. I walked to the other end of the room and glanced outside through a large window. Its elegant lace curtains swayed in the light breeze. It gave me a view of both the port town and the sea. I'll leave your key here. And I placed the key attached to a rectangular amber color or amber-colored and semi-transparent key holder on the nightstand next to the bed. Anyway, I'll get back to work now. You're free to go anywhere you want inside the inn. 
We also periodically check the windows, bathrooms, and so on. But as you can see, most of the equipment is pretty old, so don't hesitate to inform us if you find that lights don't work somewhere. I will, thank you. Um, I'd love to talk with you some more. So, what would you say of having dinner together tonight? And when will that be? How about in an hour or so? Sounds good to me. Cool! I'll go pick you up in an hour then. Okay. Nanai moved to the door and left the room after making a curt bow. Alright, so that is all the time that I have for this episode, guys. In the next episode of Seabed, we are going to check out the new tips that were unlocked. So, look forward to that, because I like the extra information. Anyways, <laughs> if you haven't already, subscribe. By subscribing, you're becoming part of a legacy, and if you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up down below. I love you guys so, so much, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye!